Gresham College presents The Art of Rhetoric by Simon Lancaster. Thank you very much. Uh, this really is an honour. Um, I know Gresham well as a Londoner, um, also someone who loves reading history books. So I remember reading all of Samuel Pepys's um, entries. He used to come here whenever he was in need of a bit of titillation. It's, it's a real honour to be here. I feel like I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, I was interviewed on Five Live just after Barack Obama was elected, and they asked me whether I thought rhetoric was the new rock and roll. Um, I laughed and said that was hyperbole. Um, but I've been thinking about it ever since, and I wonder if they just got it the wrong way round. Not that rhetoric is the new rock and roll, but whether rock and roll is in fact the new rhetoric. That's my theme for tonight. You see, I've always had two careers running in parallel, speechwriter to anyone who's prepared to pay and musician to anyone who's prepared to listen. Um, my first job on leaving school, and don't kill me, the, you know, most people kind of go into some really dull, dreary job, was actually as a pianist in a French restaurant just off Leicester Square, and it was the most amazing job in the world because I used to kind of roll out of bed in mid-afternoon and then walk through Hyde Park and Kensington Gardens wearing my you know big sonny Walkman listening to EMF just kind of set the um, time for you um, and then I'd get to this uh, this wonderful restaurant where I'd eat foie gras and the like make eyes at the waitresses and incredibly they'd pay me they'd pay me you know 30 quid a night which was a lot of money back then um, and I could even double that um, if I played um, the odd request, which was usually happy birthday or saving, in my, saving all my love for you or something like that. Um, so it was terrific, and I'm still playing um, in a band today. We did Mirtha Tidville last week, um, so we're really going places. Um, but I've been scuttling between these two worlds, speech writing and music, for 20 years now. And the thing that has always struck me is this, how incredibly easy it is to move people from a stage when you're playing music and how phenomenally difficult it is to generate almost any meaningful reaction at all when you're making a speech. You know, when you're playing music, even if you're playing really quite badly, it's relatively easy to make people smile or even, you know, make them cry, make them well up. Whereas when you're making a speech, you're in a constant fight for attention. It's the never ending battle against the Blackberry. Um, and it's the battle many speakers lose. So what I'm gonna um, explore in my speech is whether our political and business leaders could learn something from the rock stars who keep us so captivated. Um, and I mean the real big beasts, the Jaggers, McCartneys, and Townsends, uh, the skyscrapers, the guys whose music still dominates the radio and who are still the highest grossing acts in the world, despite approaching nearly 70 years of age. So I wonder, is rock and roll the new rhetoric? How can we find out? Well, question one, if Aristotle, Cicero, I've been told I should stop calling him Cicero, it's Cicero, but this feels so wrong, doesn't it? I was told this by um, a classicist. Um, or Demosthenes came back to Earth tomorrow to host X Factor of rhetoric, looking for the people who most move and motivate society. Who do you think would win? Um, politicians, monarchs, business people, or rock and roll stars? 150 years ago, the prize, prize might have gone to politicians. Back then, people did travel hundreds of miles to watch political speeches, like Gladstone's Midlothian Address. Today, though, most political speeches are only seen in musty basements by a handful of spotty interns who like to imagine that they're extras in the West Wing. People do, however, travel hundreds of miles to go to Hyde Park to see McCartney Blur or Stevie Wonder. So question two, who puts on the best rhetorical show? Who creates the best environment for persuasion? Who does the dimmed lights? Who does the slow chanting? Who gets everyone facing the same way, upwards? 300 years ago, I'd have been talking about a church, John Wesley. Today, it's a rock concert. One of my favorite Who songs is Won't Get Fooled Again, where Pete Townsend angrily berates his audience for being hypnotized. Question three, who in society is held in highest regard? In the past, whenever you had a magnificent new place opening, it was always named after a religious figure like St. James's Park, St. Pancras Station, St. Bart's Hospital. Occasionally, they were named after monarchs, the V&A Museum, Regent Street, or the Queen Elizabeth II Conference Center. 
But in 2002, Liverpool wanted to cho choose a new name for its airport, and they chose not to name it after a moniker or a saint. Instead, they named the airport after John Lennon, and there was no controversy about this. Yet imagine the fuss if they tried to call it the Margaret Thatcher Airport, or the Tony Blair Airport, or the Michael Heseltine Airport. It's inconceivable. Now, some of you might be thinking, yes, yes, that's all very well, but rock stars are different. They're only con concerned with entertainment, not persuasion. And that's true, but it, it's not entirely true, because rock stars do need to persuade us. They need to persuade us to buy the records. And most of the time when we buy the records, we're also buying into their values and belief. And in fact, we'll pay more for those values and belief. There's a premium on that. It's the value of values. And the record companies know this, which is why 20 years ago, Jamiroquai's early albums, he was banging on about saving the environment. At the same time, he was screeching up the M1 in his Ferrari. Some rock stars are a little bit more sincere. Um, I'm not a collector of rock memorabilia by any means, but a few years back, I did buy at auction the files which John Lennon kept on the Biafra conflict in the 60s. And it was extraordinary how involved he became, making plans to fly there, getting in touch with leading academics to learn more, and eventually sending his MBE back to the Queen in protest at the conflict. He felt very deeply about this. Of course, musicians are prone to feelings of great depth. It's an intrinsic part of the artistic temperament. And it's because rock stars feel things more deeply that we are more likely to follow them. We feel their pain. They activate what brain scientists call mirror neurons. These weird little things in our minds, which mean that when we see someone hurt themselves or experience hardship, prick their finger, trip up or miss a bus, we feel their pain. Aristotle said the big emotional appeals were anger, jealousy, hope, pride, pity, envy, shame, fear. So the next question, who pushes those buttons better, rock stars or politicians? You know, I'm going to give you some examples. Which of these moved you? Gordon Brown's impassioned speech to London citizens on African development or Band-Aid? Be honest. <laughs> David Cameron's Let Sunshine Win the Day speech or John Lennon's Imagine? And Tony Blair's People Princess speech, or Elton John's Candle in the Wind, which is the best-selling record in this country of all time, you'll be ashamed to know. So where is it that politicians are going wrong? Well, just look at this. This is Ed Miliband attending the TUC rally in Hyde Park last year, and John Lennon addressing a peace rally in 1972. It's hard to know where to begin, really. I think I know where to begin with the tie. <laughs> I've not been on many marches, but I do know this. You don't wear a tie to a march. So how can politicians and business leaders get over this? What are the features that make rock stars so persuasive? How can we look at this? What kind of rhetorical perspective could we take on this? And there were a number of ways I could have cut this up. I was toying with the ideas of 50 ways to leave your audience gobsmacked. A, B, C, easy as one, two, three. But instead I decided to run with a song that some of you might remember. And it's a song from the early 90s by The Shaman. It's one of the ones um, I used to listen to. It's um, Love, Sex, Intelligence, LSI, on the side there. And I went this, with this for three reasons. One, because it connects almost perfectly to Aristotle and his idea of pathos, ethos, logos, which was head, heart, and stomach. This was based on the way that the ancient Greeks saw the human body, but the stomach did actually extend to the genitalia. We don't like to talk about this much in Britain. A Dutch professor of rhetoric once berated me for that. He said our rhetoric would be a lot better if we did. Um, the second reason is that using this perspective brings back happy memories for me. It reminds me of walking through the park to the French restaurant. And thirdly, because I thought the word sex might just help keep your attention uh, to the end of the speech. Um, so I'll start with intelligence, heads, logical communication intelligence. Um, Aristotle said the greatest thing by far is to be a master of metaphor. It is the one thing that cannot be learnt from others. 
It is also a sign of genius, since a good metaphor implies an eye for resemblance. Today, neuroscientists agree with this. The part of our brain which deals with metaphor is also the part that's associated with greater intelligence. The clue is in the word intelligence, derived from the um, Latin interlegere. This means read in between. And read in between is exactly what you do with metaphor. You take two disparate fields and talk about X as if it were Y. So you're feeling blue or grinding on or have a weight on your shoulders. We use metaphors eight times a minute, and when we do so, we paint a picture. And these pictures are like seeds that we plant in people's minds, seeds that will then grow and hopefully they will then share with others. You see the metaphor I'm using there. That is why propaganda is called propaganda. The very word contains a metaphorical idea, that of planting seeds which propagate. And metaphors can be used in rhetoric for better or for worse. For better, if I talk about giving a speech life or saying that a speech has legs, the metaphor that I'm using there, the X equals Y, is that the speech is a person. And by picking that metaphorical frame, I'm suggesting I love the speech because we're used to loving people. We have relationships with people. Um, so I'm suggesting my speech is a human. And by doing so, I'm inviting you to share my perspective so you look at the speech the same way. And you'll find people do naturally talk about things that they love using the metaphor of personification so that someone who loves their car might say they're taking her out for a spin you know just taking her out for a spin harrison ford talks about the millennium falcon like that in star wars as well or someone might say that the kitchen is the heart of their home and you find that business leaders personify their companies revealing their passion for them. So Richard Branson talks about the virgin spirit, and Steve Jobs often used to talk about Apple's DNA. These are positive metaphors. Some metaphors can be used in a far more negative fashion. If I call someone a rat, I'm saying they're vermin, and this plants in your mind the idea that extermination would be sensible. So you should always beware when that metaphor is used. Of course, the mafia use it when they're talking about informers. But you also see it in far more sinister environments. You see it in the run-up to genocide. So Hitler talked about the Jews as snakes. In Rwanda, Rwanda the Hutu called the Tutsi cockroaches. And it, it's used now in the way that the press reports Muslim extremism. You think about the way the press reported bin Laden, Saddam Hussein and Gaddafi. They were all spoken about as vermin, smoking them out, ensnaring them, hunting them down, and of course, they were discovered or suspected to be discovered in caves, holes in the ground or in pipes like vermin. And the metaphorical frame meant civilized people, by which I mean us, barely raised an eyebrow when these men, leaders in their way, revered in their own lands, were executed. There's an even more recent and even more desperately tragic example, and that's, a, that's of the heartbreakingly awful fire in Derby over the weekend in which six young children were killed. The newspapers are now reporting what a tragedy that was, and it was horrific. But these same newspapers once described this poor family using the metaphor of dirt, inviting us to think they needed to be cleaned away. One newspaper, a red top, ran the story about them under the headline, Scum Mothers Do Have em. And some might see that as a funny play of words, on words, but it's far more than that. It's very powerful. It plants an idea, a seed that grows and grows. And you can actually track this in this instance on the web. You can see the conversation moving from the original news article through to the blogs, through to, and I kid you not, vigilante chat rooms. And the metaphorical frame remained constant, that of dirt, to describe this family with the father being described as a piece of shit. That is how powerful metaphor can be in extremis. Sorry to lead us into such dark territory, but the point is that metaphors extend beyond the way we talk. They reflect and shape the way that we think, feel, and act. They are incredibly powerful. So you would think that leaders would take care to get them right, but you'd be wrong. <laughs> Instead, what we find more typically is not metaphors that clarify and illuminate, but metaphors that muddle and confuse. 
One leading politician, who I usually admire, I won't name him, but his blushes, recently said, these problems existed beneath the radar before the recession struck, but were masked by the fruits of an economic system that has now laid us low. This single sentence, a single sentence contains five completely different metaphors. So you get a radar, being struck, <laughs> masking, fruit, and laying low. So what do you visualize from that? What do you take from that? Absolutely nothing, of course. It's too much, too tangled. It's like some of the beauties they used to have in um, the program Yes Minister, gritting your teeth whilst biting the bullet. Rock stars, in comparison, they do metaphors so much better. They create simple images, easy to visualize, and therefore more likely to last. So take the clear, pure simplicity of the Beatles' long and winding road. Or Marvin Gaye's Ain't No Mountain High Enough. Or Dylan's Blowing in the Winds. All the beautiful, simple images, images that can, would, and in fact have on occasion been used by great leaders. Mandela's Road to Freedom, King's Promised Land, Macmillan's Wind of Change. Incidentally, I uh, ran a course last week and I had a German businessman on the course. Um, and we analysed the wind of change metaphor and he said to me, this is all very interesting, but why are you reading so much into a song by the Scorpions? <laughs> Rock and roll rhetoric. Um, these are not isolated examples. There are plenty more I could have used, like wild horses knocking on heaven's door, another brick in the wall. But you compare this with some of the rubbish our political leaders come out with, the squeezed middle, the axis of openness, Give us some rock and roll, please. There are many other stylistic devices which can be used to demonstrate intelligence. Demetrius wrote in On Style that style can be used to demonstrate balanced thought, rigorous thinking, and show the completion of ideas. But style is hard to find in politics these days. I was wondering, perhaps it's because there's been so much criticism of politicians in the past for focusing on style over substance that they've now gone the other way. They see virtue in being totally and utterly devoid of style. Who knows, maybe that's why Ed Miliband became leader. There are dozens of different stylistic devices that can be used, though. One of the best is antithesis, where you create a point of contrast or comparison, which creates the illusion of balance, makes you sound more considered, more likely to be right. And many of the greatest quotations in history have been based upon a rhetorical antithesis, from Hamlet's to be or not to be. JFK's asks not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Right the way through to George W. Bush's, you're either with us or you're against us. And we get similar in rock, but perhaps even more carefully crafted and beautiful, like Paul Simon's, why am I soft in the middle when the rest of my life is so hard? Or David Bowie's, put on your red shoes and dance the blues. Or Pete Townsend's, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. There's also too much, too young, no woman, no cry, get up, stand up. These are powerful lines, memorable lines, persuasive lines. Rock stars are rhetoricians. One producer who worked with Madonna in the 80s said that whenever she grew impatient in the studio, she was prone to shouting, time is money and the money is mine. And the line was so strong, he recalled it word for word almost three decades later. That's rhetoric. Of course, today's business leaders try to emulate these stylistic devices, but not with quite as much elegance. So we get things like opportunity, not threat, forward, not backward, my way or the highway. They're not as stylish, not as inspiring. You see the same in politics. So Ed Miliband used his party conference speech last year to draw a new dividing line in business between producers and predators. But the trouble was that no one really knew what he meant. It turned out even he didn't really know what he meant when he was interviewed about it by John Humphreys on the Today programme. You do get some gems, of course. Vince Cable had a goodie when he said Gordon Brown had turned from Stalin to Mr Bean. David Cameron, also against Gordon Brown, said he'd turned from the Iron Chancellor into the Plastic Prime Minister. And we saw the same formula being echoed last week when um, Ed Miliband said the Prime Minister had turned from David Cameron into David Brent. So that's one stylistic device. The other one, we, one of the other ones worth exploring is tricolon, the rule of three. Um, again, an ancient Roman device. And 
When groups of three are clumped together, it creates the illusion of completeness and finality. Again, this is a well-known rhetorical device. So you get friends, Romans, countrymen. We came, we saw, we conquered. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. And this makes things memorable. I saw an interview with Justin Fletcher, who any parents in the room will know better as Mr. Tumble of CBB's fame. Um, and he was saying that when he was given his first job at the BBC 16 years ago, the commissioning, ed commissioning editor took him into his office and said there were three things that matter in kids' TV. Contact, clarity, and commitment. It's rhetoric, it's good rhetoric. And again, it was so powerful that he's able to remember it word for word 16 years later. The rule of three is all around us. We see it in photography. We also see it in music, not surprisingly, as musical harmony is based around the triad. Our receptiveness to threes is hardwired. Our minds are used to processing thing in, things in threes, which is why we like them. So we get the rule of three in band names, earth, wind and fire, wet, 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 blood, sweat and tears. We also get it in songs. She loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jumping Jack Flash, it's a gas, gas, gas. There's also money, 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 signed, sealed, delivered, I'm yours. And then, of course, one of my own favourites, Ian Dury, sex, drugs and rock and roll. Although I think I prefer Robert Rankin's take on this, which was sex, drugs and sausage roll. <laughs> the other thing is that rock stars choose their words carefully. I'm an avid reader of Beatles books, and there's a story about Lennon McCartney writing a song in the 60s. It was about the time of help, when they were still collaborating closely. And they were struggling over one line, and John's wife, Cynthia, was with them, and she suggested a possibility. And it was something along the lines of, it's just the way it is. And this caused Lennon to fly off in a rage. He, rage. he said, you can't say just in a song. It's a nothing word. Every word has to mean something. If only politicians thought like that. In contrast, here's a paragraph from one of Oliver Letwin's biggest speeches from last year, his statement to Parliament on public services. I'll see how many of you are still awake at the end of this. To strengthen accountability, the White Paper also sets out the most radical programme of transparency for government in the public sector anywhere in the world. To unlock innovation, the White Paper commits us to diversity of provision, removing barriers to entry, stimulating entry by new types of provider, and unlocking new sources of capital. To ensure that public sector providers can hold their own on a level playing field, the White Paper sets out measures to liberate public sector bodies from red tape. If only John Lennon had been in on the drafting session for that one. Songwriters would only use words like that if they served a specific purpose. And I've just read Niall Rogers' autobiography. He was the guy behind Chic, who wrote and produced many of the biggest hits of the 70s and 80s, including Let's Dance, Like a Virgin, Good Times, and many more. There are some great insights into the way he thought about style when he talks about writing Diana Ross's song, Upside Down. And he said, I quote, We included excessively polysyllabic words like instinctively and respectfully, because we wanted to utilize Diana's sophistication to achieve a higher level of musicality. Along with the complicated verse, we deliberately made the chorus rhythmically more difficult to sing than the catchier one listen song hooks for Chic. You see, they'd thought about the linguistic style as a way to actively project character. It's easy to understand, and the contrast with Oliver Letwin is stark. Who knows what Letwin was trying to achieve with his prose? I can't imagine, apart from providing me with some useful material for this lecture. So thank you, Mr. Letwin. But this is the trouble with politicians. They speak this same language. And I can say as someone who's studied the language of all of them really very closely, they really do speak the same way from a technical perspective. There's genuinely very little difference between the rhetorical styles of Ed Miliband, Nick Clegg, and David Cameron. The other stylistic device, of course, which we find in music is rhyme. And of course, I'm not proposing that politicians or business people should make speeches in rhyme, which would be very funny, but it would also be vaguely insane. I will, however, just say this, that from a rhetorical point of view, there's research that shows people are far more likely to believe things which rhyme than things which don't. 
Rhymes suggest simplicity, and they're therefore a great way of smuggling in logical fallacies undetected. A miles a day helps you work, rest and play. Johnny Cochran in the O.J. Simpson trial, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. Which is, of course, based on a false premise that the glove didn't fit. The truth was that it did, but O.J. had made a meal of putting it on in the trial. Or another one, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. Again, based on a false premise, the premise that if you commit a crime, A, you're going to get caught, and B, you're going to go to prison, which is most unlikely. Another one, and I know this because I was Alan Johnson's speechwriter when he was Education Secretary, and the department used to have to send missives to the nation's 20,000 schools, saying, will you please stop saying, I before E except after C, because teachers kept repeating this, and yet it wasn't proved anywhere in science. S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. Um, I recently made this point to someone who works at an investment bank, and it was one of the banks that was at the centre of the financial crisis. Again, I won't name them. Um, and he said, wow, that's fascinating. So you mean like you've got to speculate to accumulate? Blimey. <laughs> I thought if only that aphorism had been exposed as a fallacy before and not after the crash. Perhaps speculation means liquidation would have been better. So that's intelligence. Some of these devices for conveying intelligence. And the next thing is love, pathos. The relationship between a rock star and their fans is at its essence an emotional transaction based on meeting one another's needs, where the rock star provides the fan with emotional support, and in return, the fan gives them adoration and follows them and makes them a leader. And that's the basic contract which underscores most leadership. But for it to work, the leader has to focus on their fans' needs. Rock stars know this. That's why they always go on about their fans. And it's why every X Factor contestant, the first thing they do is thank all the people that voted for them before their parents or anyone else. It's excruciating, it's predictable, but it's also absolutely right they do so. Aristotle said in rhetoric, of the three elements in speech making, speaker, subject, and person addressed, it is the last one, the hearer, that determines the speech's end and object. The modern way of putting this is perhaps best expressed by Frank Luntz, a US communications specialist. He said, it's not what you say that counts, it's what people hear. So you have to care about your audience to be an effective persuader. But the truth is that most politicians don't care about their audiences. They don't care about them because they know they don't have to care about them. Politics is fundamentally tribal. Most voters, not all, but most, vote for the same party their whole life. Leaders know this and exploit this. Many trade unionists couldn't stomach Blair. They had to hold their noses when he walked in the room. They saw him as a closet Tory. But they still voted for him. What alternative was there? They had nowhere else to go. Even Michael Foote managed to win 9 million votes on a manifesto which Gerald Kaufman famously described as a suicide note. So we're left with politicians who spend all their time worrying about and addressing the tiny number of swing voters in swing seats whilst ignoring everyone else. And this complacency about the wider audience is incredibly corrosive, driving more and more people away from politics. The reason most people don't care about politics is simple. It's because most politicians don't care about people. Rock stars couldn't get away with this. They have to care about their audiences. They have no choice. Because where political audiences are tribal, rock audiences are incredibly fickle. There's no such thing as loyalty in rock. Many of the big beasts have discovered this to their cost. Paul McCartney, Gary Barlow, Dar David Bowie all saw their audiences literally decimated when they produced a stinker. Gary Barlow went from the pinnacle of success with Take That to being dumped by his record company in less than three years. The best rock stars keep their audiences close. They play the crowd pleasers. They touch the hands. They crowd surf. They have a few groupies round the back. They let it all hang out, literally in Iggy Pop's case. And the best businesses do the same. Everything starts with what the customer wants. And when you get a similar complacency appearing in business, it creates a similar backlash. Remember when Ratner famously castigated his customers for buying products that were crap. The best politicians do put their audiences first. Remember Obama's mantra, it was yes we can, not yes I can. And Bill Clinton never had any problem engaging directly with audiences. Let me just 
show this clip of Bill Clinton in action. This is not beanbag, this is life and death. And we've got to go into that's not true. Without parental permission, you know it's true. Now will you just calm down? If I were dying of ambition, I wouldn't have stood up here and put up with all this crap I've put up with the last six months. I'm fighting to change this country. And let me tell you something else. Let me tell you something else. You do not have the right to treat any human being, including me, with no respect because of what you're worried about. I did not cause it. I'm trying to do something about it. I have treated you and all the people who've been around. If that's not rock and roll, I don't know what is. And of course, showing a clip from Bill Clinton leads me perfectly to my third and final point, which is sex. Um, I said about Aristotle's ethos, pathos, and logos being based around the way the ancient Greeks saw the human body. And the idea that our character comes from deep below remains prevalent today. We talk of gut instinct, or politicians having balls, or people shooting from the hip. You know, the idea we think with our hearts, feel with our hearts, and act with our um, stomachs. Um, but essentially what we're talking about here is our spirit, what shapes our spirit and our character. Um, and Aristotle wrote in rhetoric, moral character nearly carries with it the most sovereign efficacy in making credibility. And he wrote about the characteristics we like to see in our speakers, health, fortune, strength, power, beauty, gymnastic excellence, and such characteristics remain equally admirable today. But are these features ones we would readily associate with politicians or with rock stars? What do you think? Jagger versus Prescott, McCartney versus Eric Pickles, Brown and Blair were both put out to pasture before they'd even seen out their 50s, whilst all the big beasts of rock are still going strong well into their late 60s. Why did Michael Foote and Neil Kinnock lose elections? <coughs> Professor Jonathan Charteris Black at the University of West of England wrote in his book, The Communication of Leadership, that their problem was, I quote, that they were not naturally endowed with appearances conducive to positive media representations, which is probably the politest way possible of calling someone ugly. Look at Boy George, Annie Lennox, Tina Turner, Freddie Mercury, David Bowie. You know, they're beautiful. But there's something else about them. They look different. They don't look like the rest of us mere mortals. And isn't this an essential requirement of leadership? Isn't it true that our leaders, by definition, have to be different to the rest of us? A great leader must be removed from where other people are if he is to lead, otherwise he is not leading, he's just standing in line. A leader needs to stand outside the establishment, not in it. And this seems counterintuitive because we imagine most leaders come from the establishment, but real leaders do not. Most have experienced real struggles to get to the top, and it's the struggle which we admire, which we find inspiring. Perhaps it is the emotional turmoil of isolation which gives them their leadership qualities. Look at the great leaders from history. On one end of the spectrum, Jesus, Muhammad, and Buddha, all of whom spent long periods in isolation during their formative years. On the other side of the spectrum, all of the great dictators, Stalin, Hitler, Napoleon, all of them were ethnic minorities in the lands they went on to conquer. Georgian, Austrian, and Corsican, respectively. Winston Churchill and Margaret Thatcher were both outsiders in the Tory party. Churchill had crossed the floor twice in his career. Tony Blair was an outsider in the Labour Party, and Barack Obama was a definite outsider in the Democratic Party, knocking the establishment show in Hillary Clinton right out of the water. It's true that in business as well, leaders must also be outsiders. Steve Jobs, Richard Branson, Rupert Murdoch, have always played around the fact that they are outsiders. They kept the position up throughout their lives. Even as they became the establishment, 
They took great pains to ensure that they were always seen to be outside it. They constantly shifted the perspective so they were the rebels, not the insiders. And it's no coincidence, perhaps, that all of them brushed up against the law at different points in their career. Steve Jobs put it beautifully. When you grow up, you tend to get told the world is the way it is and your life is just to live your life inside the world. Try not to bash into the walls too much. Try to have a nice family life, have fun, save a little money. That's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, that everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you and that you can change it, you can influence it, you can build your own things that other people can use. Maybe the most important thing is to shake off this erroneous notion that life is there and you've just got to live it versus embrace it. Once you learn that, you'll never be the same again. Another great way of illustrating this outsider point is this little clip here, which some of you might remember as an Apple ad from the 1990s. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them. Because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. So read that across to modern business today. Where are the other outsiders? It's curious that since the crash, more and more FTSE CEOs are coming up from finance director posts. They're people who have grown up within the company. They're insiders. They're struggling to connect. What about politics? Where are the outsiders? You look at Miliband, Clegg and Cameron. They're not outsiders, they're insiders. And not just insiders within their parties, but insiders to the whole political establishment. They have identical CVs, they're insiders, they're struggling to connect. The outsiders are there. You can spot them easily in Parliament. Just watch PMQs. They're the ones wearing grey suits, rejecting the normal blue or black. They're rejecting the instinct to conform, the groupthink. Dennis Skinner, Simon Hughes, that lot. But they tend to not to get on. The Conservative Party in particular seems to have been taken over by insiders. The few working class members to have joined their ranks recently have been treated disgracefully. David Davis, Nadine Dorries, John Burko, briefings against them have said they are unbalanced, mad or annoying. It's not hard to see the class prejudice which lies beneath the surface of these attacks, which is a great shame. The Tories seem to have forgotten that their largest ever popular vote was won by a working class prime minister. John Major. John Major was also an outsider, also briefed against, and also very rock and roll, as we now know with Edwina Curry. <laughs> so it seems to me, in answer to the questions I posed at the beginning of my lecture, that rock stars are outperforming politicians and business leaders, and there is much that can be learned from them. I'm not saying I want more of Neil Kinnock at Sheffield's. This all right. I'm not saying I want more William Haig in his baseball cap, Notting Hill Carnival, more of Gordon Brown talking about the Arctic Monkeys or David Cameron saying that his favourite song was Eaton Rifles when he'd clearly never taken time to think about the lyrics of the song. What I am saying is that we need more rock and roll leaders and rock and roll can't be acted, rock and roll just is. It's part of your being, it's flowing through your veins. It's Steve Jobs with his permanent revolutionary mindset and his painful, constant, never-ending quest for perfection. It's Richard Branson cavorting with his supermodels, his screw it, let's do it attitude to business, and his rather unorthodox office on a barge in Little Venice. 
And it is Tony Blair, the frustrated musician, once lead singer in a band called The Ugly Rumours, carrying his guitar into Downing Street. And it's Bill Clinton with, as we saw just there, his inordinate resemblance to what Elvis Presley might have looked like if he lived. So turn off the parliamentary channel, turn on the iPod, show the passion, show the dreams, reveal the inner self. One way of putting it, ethos, pathos, logos. Another way of putting it, move like Jagger. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting you use the Gerald Ratner uh, example, but um, Eric Schmidt, who's the senior person in Google, uh, has made far many more gaffes than, say, he has. In fact, people actually collect his uh, weird sayings, and it's funny how he hasn't got the feedback that Gerald Ratner was. It's just the way he's presenting. I, I suppose the issue, though, is actually it's not one quite so much... This is my opinion. It's not quite so much one about the quality of the speech that was given, but more about the conduct of the press and how the press are able to lead debate in our country and just pick up a story and then magnify it and all of a sudden it gathers its own life, which was, as I recall, exactly how it happens with Ratner, that he made the speech and everyone in the room warmly applauded and then he went home feeling very satisfied with himself having done a good job and then the following morning, I think it was the Daily Mirror who first had an article, you know, with the, with the story on the front page and then it blew and blew. And so I suppose the point there is that the press felt it would be okay to take on, um, to take on Ratner. I can well see why the press would not want to take on Eric Schmidt. Yeah, it's a lot of with, uh, Google. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But you're absolutely right. I've, I've seen... There's a wonderful clip I've seen of Eric Schmidt actually given a speech as part of a public speaking rehearsal um, back when he was in his mid-twenties. And it's wonderful seeing him as, you know, just another young, nervous kid trying to make his first speech because, of course, he's, he's one of the most powerful men in the world now. You mentioned one or two examples like Hitler, but I wonder about sort of the ethical aspects of rhetoric and how it might impinge on brainwashing or whatever. Yeah. Um, I think, I mean, I think the point is, is that rhetoric is kind of, is morally neutral. It's up to the person who has rhetorical skill, how they use it, whether they use it for good or for bad purposes. There's no denying the fact that Hitler was the most amazing rhetorician. You know, you can see the videos of his speeches on YouTube and my god anyone wants to talk about conviction you know that man absolutely epitomizes it you can see as he's making his speeches he's he's shaking with anger he's so furious and so wound up and of course it's that point that I was making about mirror neurons that you see someone acting like that you see someone overwrought with emotion and it rubs off on you it makes you feel that you should you should probably share that emotion um, and of course Hitler, you know, I mean Hitler brainwashed a nation. I wonder if I could just add in response to that, because obviously um, as a, a speechwriter you have to, you know, you have to make moral decisions as well about the kind of work that you did and my sort of personal crossroads on that was when I was um, a cabinet speechwriter in 2002, 2003, as the Iraq conflict was breaking out. And I personally was very against the war, but nevertheless I was writing speeches which had to be in support of the war. And I kind of grappled with this dilemma, as one does down the pub with one's friends. And um, one's friends told me to stop being a silly git. <laughs> that the person I was writing for was the one that had been elected, and it was my job to write for her. And I actually thought that that was the right thing in a, democrat, you know, in a democracy. Um, now I'm running my own business, so I have kind of different calls to make, and there's, you know, there's not been anyone I, who's called me yet who I've found so repugnant that I wouldn't write a speech for them. I mean, particularly in 
political terms now, um, you know, there's not an awful lot of difference. It's, it's hard to find a real difference between the parties. Thank you. Um, following on from what you just said, you used to be a speechwriter for politicians. So mm. can we lay some of the blame at your door for the, <laughs> the problems that politicians have nowadays? <laughs> Because, I mean, no. in, in the past, <laughs> <laughs> surely today it's all about sound bites. Mm. That's what TV wants. They're not used to speaking to large people on the stump, so to speak, like they used to do 100 years or so ago. And so surely those, those great speakers aren't out there anymore. Yeah. You know, Boris Johnson maybe, or, or some, some people, but they're very few. And so it's completely different. Yeah. I think... I, th I think what you actually find, it's like, you know, in this kind of, the, the questions are related in, in, in a way, I think, that the, the language is changing. Um, but I think what you're finding is that politicians are now trying far more to replicate the language of the street when they speak. They're trying to be far more colloquial in their style. And so the kind of thing that you would have seen, like Gladstone's Midlothian address, I mean, you know, try and read it. You know, it's, it's pretty weighty stuff. Um, whereas now, of course, you get um, David Cameron coming out with things like, you know, it's because I, I, I love the NHS that I want to protect the NHS. So you are seeing politicians, they're trying to connect, they're trying to connect more. Um, I mean, it's a difficult, you know, it's a difficult thing to get right. From my point of view, the system, I'm sorry to say this, it's an awful cop out, but the system is what the system is. And I kind of see my job which is rhetoric, obviously, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but I see my job as just being bringing my technical ability to help people, you know, who have got jobs which are more important than mine. Yeah? No, it seems that there's a sort of two, two different lines one can take in rhetoric. Either you can try to be as like the people as possible I mean, in the last point you made about the language is like the, like the people, or you can try to stand out. Now, are they contradictory, these two urges, or can one combine the two? So, just explain the difference between the two again. Well, the, the first is you're supposed to be like the audience, you know, you, mm. you're supposed to be, you know, if, again, if you're a young person, you should be a young person, or, or try to look as young as possible. Or you, uh, if, if, or you should match them in race and so on, or in dress it and so on. Uh, and the other thing is, you were saying about that one needs to stand out. You know, um, I know some people seem to be able to, to do the, the the two things, but uh, are, are they contradictory or are, are they applicable in different circumstances? I I don't think they are different. I I th can think of plenty of examples of leaders including, you know, rock stars who have been very, very different from the people that they've, they're addressing, but they're still able to connect. It may be, there does need to be a big point of connection, but that does it, you know, you can connect with anyone. And I think this point about, I think it's an interesting point, this about the outsider, because I wonder if that's why we're able to identify <coughs> with outsiders, because we all perhaps feel a little like that ourselves deep down so you can see this stuff you know like think difference all of these and maybe we all think that's us so we can identify that so the, being difference is a point of connection if you see what i mean i'm not sure i've i've answered your question particularly well but does that do, what do you think i don't know i'm just i'm just wondering whether some of those leaders you know whether say Germans would look at, at old Hitler as a, a blooming Austrian, or a Frenchman would look at Napoleon and think, well, that's a, he's a Corsican, he's not really a proper Frenchman. I wonder yeah. if that was... Well, I, how, I, do they, how do you think they reacted? Mm. It's, I mean, it's a very good question. I, I wonder whether the, the thing was that Hitler just, uh, you know, epitomised the German psyche at the time, yeah. and this idea of, you know, that it felt um, almost vaguely you know, dirty to be a German, you know, yeah. after the First World War with the whole reparations and stuff like that. So having an ethnic minority as someone who, who was their leader was actually 
was able to, you know, they, they could identify with that sense of isolation being on the outside. Yeah, 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 it's just that I'm speculating. Yeah, oh, yes, I think we are, we are, aren't we, really? You know, the fact that there's the outsider. Now, I, I heard, I saw quoted by Sefton Delmer in a book that Hitler had told him, you, 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 you've got to find the Schweinhund, or he called the bastard in, 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 in everyone <laughs> to appeal to. Oh, really? <laughs> that's a great quote. <laughs> so, so maybe that's the same sort of thing, really, isn't it? <laughs> you've, got, you've got to appeal to people's resentment, if you like. Yeah, well, I, I mean, you know, anger is, is the most, yeah. you know, an, an incredibly yeah. powerful emotion. You think, uh, but you need to, your audience to feel that, and I think that was what... That you need to recognise what is the dominant emotion likely to be yeah. within the room that I am addressing. And so if it's anger, I mean, I think people like, like, the, like the TUC, yeah. the speakers that do best at TUC are the angry ones. Yeah. And it's people, you know, it's people like Scargill, like Prescott, yeah. you know, like um, Nye Bevan way back. Um, and, you know, it's those kind of people that absolute thumping... Okay their fists yeah, yeah. and it may be that that is the predominant emotion which is just bubbling beneath the surface all of the time anyway and it just takes the speaker to yeah. let it out and i know i noticed in, in, in I, mean, I, I looked at most of those leaflets i got uh, about recent elections and i looked at them in terms of rhetoric really yeah. and uh, they often appeal to the fact you're being neglected by you know that they're, they're ignoring you you know they're, they're, they, they don't care about wherever you happen to live, say, like Redbridge, where I, li where I live, yeah. yeah. That seemed to be that line, that resentment line that they yeah. were appealing to. Well, I, I made the point in my speech that I think what you've got is politicians ignoring the big audience that is out there and just focusing on these few swing voters in swing seats. And, I mean, to kind of characterise that voter... I would guess that he's a bit angry, a bit resentful, and a bit racist as well, with the way that the political parties all, you know, steer their emotional appeals. Um, first of all, thank you very much for an interesting speech. Um, I've got two points. How did you get to become an employable speech writer? <laughs> and also, is it beneficial that you appear to be one of the ordinary people, in as much as politicians would like a speech that you seem to relate more to Mr. Everybody. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so the first question, how did I become a speechwriter? I was a civil service fast streamer. And so as a civil service fast streamer, you find yourself working in minister's offices. Every, you know, you do a private secretary, like the private secretary role in Yes Minister. Um, and so I did that, and it's the most, it's, I mean, it's almost amazing as playing piano in a French restaurant, actually. I feel like I have been rather blessed in my career. Um, and you do it when you're incredibly young. You know, I was a private secretary when I was, I was 24 and was uh, working uh, for Alan Johnson in his first ministerial post. Um, and we used to go all over the world together on these flash visits, you know, um, going to places like Taiwan, Bangladesh, Washington. Um, and it was, the most, it was the most amazing job. And just doing this, I, I grew absolutely fascinated by the power of rhetoric. And it was watching him, really, um, and I remember, I remember, because, you know, I think he's an incredible, an incredible um, politician, you know, and I, I think he, he would have made an amazing leader of the Labour Party as well. Um, and I think he has that thing about the outsider. He's had a proper job. He was a postman. He left school when he was 15. But hey ho, you know, what will, what will be will be. Um, and it was watching him make speeches. And I can remember the speech I saw him make, which... I found really inspiring. It was a speech at the TUC um, up in Harrogate. And like he, he was talking about trade unionism. I remember we'd got the train up there and he'd had his draft speech from the civil service, which I'd read beforehand as the private secretary and thought, perfectly satisfactory, long list of things we've done since 1997. Um, and he read it, this is shit, and tore it up and then started writing again from scratch. And he made this speech, um, which I can still remember how he, he begun it. And it, it, it began... Um, <laughs> I can still remember how he started it. <laughs> 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 um, it. It was Hitler, Mussolini, Stalin. The first thing all of these guys did on their route to the top was ban trade unions in their country. 
and that's because they understood that trade unions are an essential part of a fully functioning democracy. And he then went on to make the argument in so many different ways, like using statistics, like the fact that trade union membership had gone from, I think, 16 million to 9 million under Margaret Thatcher, using all of these examples of people he had helped when he was leader of the Commercial Workers Union. And just he took the argument from so many different angles. And I was someone who, you know, you can tell my age, I grew up with Thatcher as Prime Minister. So I'd never really had much time for trade unions. I remember, you know, starting work in the civil service and having the trade union rep, you know, stand by my desk and try to sign me up and just, you know, wishing it it go and I didn't really have a, my view of trade unions were they were a waste of time. I remember all the footage of the minor strike and he did actually swing me round in one speech. And you know, as acts of persuasion go, that was pretty phenomenal. But I saw him in all sorts of other contexts as well, like addressing small rooms, you know, of of elderly elderly people who were incredibly concerned about their local post office closing. And just the way he was just, he was a very good persuader. And so that was how I got into it. And I was just watching, thinking, how is he doing that? And then I started reading books about it. And then uh, when Patricia Hewitt joined uh, the cabinet, she asked me to go and become her speechwriter. And so I went to work for her for a few years. And then, you know, there was no, there were, no one's really exposed rhetoric, the art of rhetoric. When I became a speechwriter, I went to Politico's, the bookshop in Westminster, looking for books on rhetoric, and there were none. There were absolutely none. There were bad books on how to write speeches, but none told me about Aristotle. And I remember there was one time when I went to, um, I went to my wife's uncle's place, and he's a classicist, and he said, oh, you're a speechwriter. You'll know all about the rule of three then. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, oh, you've got to start reading you know, Aristotle and Quintilian and all of this. And so it's, it's really down to him that I then started reading, you know, the classical books. And it's extraordinary because supposedly authoritative studies of rhetoric that came out, you know, from professors in the 80s, you know, were published and didn't even refer to Aristotle or classical, you know, rhetoric. And so that's why I wrote my book. I thought, you know, the, these old tricks, you know, techniques, approaches, you know, they, they need to be understood today because, of course, this is where Gresham is such an amazing, amazing institution. You know, it's, a, the, uh, it's why I'm so honoured to be here because I've written about the place before for having, you know, to, to give a, put on these lectures in rhetoric for over 400 years now. And it's a tragedy, really, because, um, you know, rhetoric used to be on the curriculum. It was, you know, part of the trivium back in ancient Rome, ancient Greece. You know, and here, here you would learn rhetoric, and I find it extraordinary that at the same time that education went universal, 1870 Education um, Act, rhetoric all of a sudden disappeared from the curriculum. It's almost like, well, we can't, we can't allow everyone to understand this. And yet, of course, it's, you know, you just can't have, you can't have a fair society or a fair democracy unless everyone is able to express themselves eloquently, because otherwise you can't stand for parliament, can you? You can't, um, you know, exercise your legal rights, your societal rights. And so, you know, I think at the moment our education system is, is appalling, really. You know, we've got teachers who can't spell, you know, teaching kids how to write. And I'm not joking. My daughter's, I've got a three-year-old daughter who's at nursery at the moment, and they've got pictures of umbrellas that the kids have been doing, and they've spelled umbrella, <laughs> umbrella, with a, an E in the middle. And I, I just looked at it and was like, you know, my God, what hope is there really? You know, so, and I, you know, I just think, and this is, I can see you shaking your head in horror. This is absolutely, as a, this, is, this is of course a nursery, nursery that has been adjudged to be, you know, outstanding by Ofsted, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> But you see, I would, in, in this day and age, I would actually, I would put rhetoric, you know, on, on a par 
with, with reading, writing and arithmetic. You know, I, w I would say that we, we need four hours because it's just such a, such a vital skill. You know, and it would, I think it would resolve a, a lot of problems. And in terms of you saying, you know, my, um, what did you say, the second so question? If, if possibly they, they like to employ you because you'd be able to relate more to everyday man. And some <laughs> of them can't, I would assume. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Your speeches would be more, yeah. they could relate to more. I, I, I like to think that they employ me because of my technical expertise, but I might just... <laughs> uh, who am I kidding? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I can't, I, I'm generally, um, characteristically, I'm quite an impatient person. And, you know, if, if I'm not understanding something, I'm just like, just get to the point. Just get to the point. I'm always saying, just get to the point, you know? Come on, quick, quick, quick. And so if you give me... You can give me a 70-page turgid report, and I, you know, I'm pretty good at just whoosh, cutting through it and saying in one paragraph how we can, how can I, how we can argue it. Yeah, but I do try when I, I write speeches for other people. I try to make them feel really, really natural. You know, a lot of people will get to the the lectern and kind of. The, 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 they, they, they think they've got to pump themselves up in so to Gladstone. I've got to put on an act. Or something, and when I write, I do, I do try to think it's actually just one person. You're just speaking to one person. Richard Branson, curiously, when he was um, younger, he had terrible problems public speaking, and he writes about this in his um, autobiography, Losing My Virginity. He says in there, he, he describes a, a time, I think it was 19, and he was making a speech, and he was on with Terry Kelly and all of this lot. And he said he just got up there, and he completely froze completely froze, didn't know what to do. And he said that ever since then, he's just imagined when he's making a speech, he's just talking to one person, just talking to one person, one on one. And you can feel that. And I think that's something you feel when you see a lot of great orators today, like Barack Obama can be addressing 300,000 people, his speech at Grant Park, Chicago. Um, and yet you feel like he's actually just talking to, to one person. And you get the same things with um, rock stars as well, you know, like Paul McCartney. I've seen Paul McCartney do play about four times now. Every time he just like strolls out, like he's just, you know, walking into the front room and, you know, anyone fancy hearing a few tunes tonight? <laughs> For all information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.